Welcome, welcome everyone to my first ever uh, LinkedIn Live. We're going to be live on YouTube as well. Uh, I'm Petra, mental health consultant, and we've got Ngozi Weller, who has joined us very last minute. I just knew you would be up for it and happy <laughs> to give us some of your wisdom on short you notice. Knew I'd so be welcome. Happy to talk. You knew I'd be happy to I, talk. I, I knew it would be easy for you. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. If it makes any sense, that would be a bonus, right? Well, let's see where we go. I know we want to talk about the workplace, the new world of work, and a bit about leadership mm -hmm. as well, because that's both the, the space that we're both in. Um, mm -hmm. So just introduce yourself, first of all. What do you do? What, you know, what are you about? Why does this topic matter to you? Oh, that's a big question. So my name's Ngozi Wella, and I am the co-founder of a company called Aurora Wellness, and we are a mental health and well-being consultancy, and we work with lots of businesses, small, medium enterprises who are looking to be proactive in supporting their employee well-being through coaching, uh, workshops, training programs, a strategy, all sorts of stuff. Um, it, I mean, we're in similar spaces, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's how we, that's how we got to know each other, which is great. Um, but, you know, the topic is, is really important to me because it's personal for me. I, I was one of those unfortunate um, people who now um, DMA talk about one in four people experiencing mental health and um, a recent survey by Benetton Health showed that there's one in three people in the, in the workplace with an undisclosed mental health condition right so I was one of those one in three um, I suffered a nervous breakdown I call it a nervous breakdown even if it's not the politically correct thing because it felt like that's that. what it felt like it felt like a breakdown i suffered from what was diagnosed at the time as work-related stress anxiety and depression um and uh it, it would now be diagnosed as burnout petra as you know of course um, burnout yeah. is now a recognized medical term but I, I basically burnt out of my corporate career um in 2017 and i have been on a mission ever since to make sure that all employees have access to the kind of mental health support that wasn't available to me in my time in need. And what, what do you think led you to that point? Because we work in businesses and the, the corporate mm -hmm. is a very specific beast, isn't it? Um, with specific pressures, leadership, um, vision, and these days lots of restructures and so many things going on. But like in hindsight, what were the key components or stresses that maybe led you to that point? Oh, Hindsight is a wonderful teach, right? At the time, I thought I was doing okay. And at the time, I thought everything I felt was just what it means to be an adult. I called it adulting. This is it, and it sucks, and nobody wants to do it. Um, but I didn't realize, actually, that it wasn't healthy, it wasn't normal, and it wasn't necessary. What led me there was a toxic combination. It was... Um, I was determined to break through the brown glass ceiling, right? Yeah. And uh, so you've got the glass ceiling and you've got the brown glass ceiling, which is a few floors below. And I was a working mother who had, was a primary caregiver. So I was no longer as available to my employer as I was before. I had the audacity to have children and yeah. take care of them. And um, I was determined that neither that nor my race nor my gender was going to be a barrier to my success. I could see that I deserved to be in positions more senior to the ones I was given. So I just thought I have to work harder, right? I yeah. just have to try more. And I kept trying more and I kept getting good feedback, mediocre feedback, excellent praise. Oh, you're going to do much better. And then when that never materialized in promotion, when I kept being overlooked, yeah. thanked for my service, but overlooked for promotion, I recognized, actually, it was really clear the one day that it happened when I was told that the reason that I was not progressing was because I was too jokey. I was like, oh, oh. What, what does that even actually mean? I'm not going around putting whoopee cushions on people's chairs. So what does that actually mean and when there was no concrete evidence i realized what they meant is you don't fit mm. with it didn't matter what, what you did it doesn't it didn't matter what i did 
And then I realized, okay, so I am actually a parrot in a gilded cage. I think I've got luxury and freedom, but I, I can't fly and I'll mm. never be able to fly. Um, and that is when it, it literally, something inside my brain just broke because I realized I could do whatever I wanted and it was wow. never going to change. Wow. And, and, and people what, under different pressures all the time, you know, sure. but that, that was it for me. And do you think that your managers and leaders, of course, you have specific ones that were using those reasons, but do you think that that played a part in, in that experience and you eventually oh. getting, heading to breakdown? Of course. And that's why I keep harping on about line managers being the key to supporting employee well-being. Because we had an employee assistance program, an EAP, in the company I worked in. Did you ever call the it? world's largest oil companies. No. Right. Why? I didn't. Why? Nobody pointed me in that direction. And this is the reason why I, I don't, I'm not saying anything negative about EAPs. But consistently, EAPs are underutilized. Consistently. How can we have one in three employees in the workplace with an undisclosed mental health condition or undisclosed health condition, of which mental health is the predominant one? How can we have that and have EAPs, which are consistently used by less than 10% of the population? Well, that's because EAPs require the person who is ill or going through the difficulty yeah. to have the wherewithal and the strength of character and strength of mind and the knowledge the to knowledge. say, I'm going to reach out, pick up the phone and call these strangers and discuss my problems with them. Yeah. Not, it's not easy to do that, right? And there's a lack of trust about that. So it's got to be someone who is um, in frequent contact and who has built up a trust relationship with that employee who can say, I try, I'm not sure that things are okay. I've yeah. noticed X, Y, and Z. Um, how can we help? and who will guide them to the support that's available. Yeah. So we need a, a mirror held up to us sometimes, especially like we take some of this for granted, right? Like uh, listening yeah. to our bodies or going, oh, that's an early sign of anxiety or burnout or these different things because we both learned the hard way, right? But it yeah. feels like the role of the manager is changing because back in the day, they didn't have to go through their management training and kind of think, how do I have empathy? How do I support some? How do I notice, right? Like, what do you think's changed? And what are some of the, the skills that people need to, um, as, to, to be a, a useful leader in this day and age? Yes, yeah, so much has changed. You're absolutely right. And I have every sympathy for managers who went through the school of management like I did in the 90s yeah. and the early noughties, where we were told it's all about um, driving profitability, driving productivity, helping your employees to perform at their absolute best without recognition that employees need to feel at their best to perform at their best. It was never a thing. No. We didn't learn that when I went to business school. We didn't learn about how you can view your biggest resource, your human resource, as a human first and how you can therefore extract the best from them by wanting the best for them. Um, so I, I, I complete empathy. This isn't me knocking managers. This is me saying sure. companies need to recognize that there's a skills gap now. And that skills gap is focused on the stuff that we traditionally think of as the soft stuff. Yeah. Right? The people skills. How do you lead? Traditionally, we, we talk a lot about this at Aurora, the rise of the new leader. I've got like a, 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 a round table that we host on this, and I've written a couple of articles about it. because. Before, if you were the best, uh, I don't know, data um, entry inputter on your team, you'd then get promoted to maybe senior and then from sure. there, team leader, and then from team leader to department manager, blah, blah, blah. It was all about your functional competence or capability. Yeah. Not how you related to humans or how you can bring out the best in other people. That shifted very, very quickly two years ago when we first had yeah. the impact of coronavirus it became blatantly clear to companies that we need to support employee well-being if we're even going to manage to get through this never mind to, to thrive so now we're asking our managers to support employee well-being but we haven't supported either the managers and their well-being or supported them to know 
how to do it. How do you manage people? Not so there's roles. The, yeah, and there's the skill set of managing people. But then we, I think people sometimes forget that, that those managers are going through the pandemic themselves, right? Whether exactly. it's children off school or parents who are ill or the, you know, partners, whatever the, the context is that we are all experiencing in some way, working from your living room like I am, you know, wh whatever it is. And so what about if a manager is listening and they're like, well, that's all good and well, right? But I've got so many pressures to deliver on from sort of restructures mm -hmm. or change, right? And yet I'm also now expected to be a therapist, to be like, tell me about your children, you know, and, and the stress levels that, that yeah. they may think they're under. Like, how do we navigate that piece? And it is really tough. Yeah. I say, number one, you're not expected to be a therapist. Right. But Good you point. are expected to be a people manager, right? And I say, uh, when, when we train our managers on our angel of well-being, the very first thing we do is, train you as a manager on how to look after your own well-being because as exactly. i love to say you cannot pour from an empty cup you cannot give what you do not have so if you're not doing well there is no way you will have the ability it is actually physically impossible for you to look up from the introspection that you're in the mountain of work and stress and you know home and all of that that you're trying to deal with to look out and see how everybody else is doing. If you do manage to do it, it's because you know that you should do it and it's a bit disingenuous and it won't work. So you have to look after yourself. And from that comes your ability to look out for other people. So I, I say, yeah, I completely get that you have been tasked with too much. And that's why there's like, it, it, it has to come from the top. A culture yeah. of change is what is required. Yeah. So. Um, we can't just put all of this on middle management. What, what I'm hearing is mm -mm. leadership needs to be thinking about the culture overall in this new hybrid world or all the little buzzwords, right? Um, and also put mm -hmm. some resource into supporting themselves, managers around the conversation around well-being, but also the skills. Those previously known as soft skills aren't, aren't exactly soft anymore. Well, they may still be considered soft, but that doesn't mean they're any less important. Okay, my cat's going to come into view. She, she has an opinion too. Oh, we like um, cats. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, those, skill, those soft skills are what will enable you to extract the hard metrics and results. And we have to, this is something else that we talk about in one of our own tables. We have to learn how we can quantify those soft skills. We have to quantify happiness so that employee well-being becomes just as significant a metric as any other KPI an organization might track and steward. We have to, or else it won't happen. And we have to recognize it, not because it's just the right thing to do or the moral thing to do, but because it's the fiscally responsible thing to do for yeah. any organization. Yeah. And yeah. we're seeing this in... If you don't look in... after your people, they yeah. can't look after you. Yeah. And we're seeing this in the great resignation, right? That little catchphrase exactly. just around people are reflecting and thinking, actually, life is short. What's important to me, right? Um, we've got a couple of comments and I wanna encourage anybody who has a question for Ngozi or myself to please go ahead and, and throw them in. But some, uh, I love this one, Umar. I love the social mantra of know yourself, be yourself, look after yourself. So it's, I'm hearing that it starts with self-awareness, excellent comment. Uh, and we've got one here from Elizabeth. Thank you for commenting. It's about business cultures and what is considered accepted, especially when it is related to systemic behaviors that were not previously challenged. Very good point. And from what I saw, it became almost acceptable. So that sounds like your old workplace a little bit. It was just the norm to behave in a particular way. And then you had the, the added layer of the brown ceiling as you referred to it. Um, and then the consistent frustration and your, um, I guess, way of fixing it was just work harder, prove yourself, prove yourself, prove yourself to the point of exhaustion and burnout. Yeah, we, we, we had, it's not just my company, it was many companies, yeah. and it's only recently that we started to question whether having uh, too, too many emails to, to humanly answer in a day is a badge of honor or not. We come from this kind of toxic overwork culture where being too busy is, is almost equated with a sign of importance, 
and therefore you feel good that you're overworked. It's it's not healthy. It's never been healthy, but we're now starting to see that for what it is. Well, we are, but we're both founders and business owners ourselves now, and it's <laughs> it's, it's it's a slippery slope. That right? Like if somebody said, you know, yeah. how was your week? I would still automatically say, oh, super busy, right? And I think in Western society, they, like you said, it's still this subtle badge of honor of like, you know, I hustled or I, I, I put, in, put in the hours, whereas it's still less natural for many of us to go, yeah, I just really slowed down. I meditated, I connected with my kids, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's this hustle culture. How is it translated just to you running your own business? Oh, believe me, we still have to hustle. And yeah. I am not advocating that, oh, we should get rid of it, only have a half day working day and don't work. I'm a, I'm a classic type A, A1 person. I like work. I especially love the work I do. I yeah. love working. But it's about recognizing that if I do not find balance in my life, that stops. It will stop because it stopped for a year when I burnt out. Yeah. So I have to look after myself. You have a responsibility to look after yourself. You have a responsibility to your employees and your family to look after them, yourself. So yeah, the hustle, the pressure is always going to be there. Technology, which has helped in so many ways, has also meant that our expectations of what is achievable by one person in a 24 hour period have gone sky high. Yeah. But, but just because the pressure is there doesn't mean you have to always succumb to it. And sometimes it is just um, about knowing what you need for yourself. So in those days when I was really struggling and burning out, I would work and sometimes until one in the morning. What, what person is doing good work at one in the morning, getting up at 6.30, getting the kids ready for school, go and starting again? Who? Nobody is, but you think that's what you need to do. But if I had said, I can't, I'm stopping, I'm stopping, it's, 6 p.m. I'm stopping. I'm going for a walk. I may have come back and been able to do uh, in half an hour. Endurance. It was taking me two hours to do. Yes. And that's yeah. all the science behind productivity sh shows that now, right? Which is those that active recovery, Absolutely. those rests actually come back more focused and more productive. Um, a couple questions. What For you personally, what are your early warning signs now? So that you you kind of go, oh, I know that one. I you know I got to pull back or do the things that maybe you do to invest in yourself a bit more consciously. For me, um, it's it's always irritability. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I start snapping yeah. at people. Yeah, yeah, it's that. It's when I start to find the people who I care most about, i.e., my children, my husband, annoying. Yes. Um, <laughs> because they're distracting me from what I perceive as the really, really important stuff. When I start ha finding that happening a lot, I need to start to slow down. Yeah, it's a warning sign. Also, when I start to find myself saying those phrases, like, I'm just yeah. too busy to go for a walk. Yeah. How can anybody be so busy they can't take a lunch break? But, yeah. but it happens, but then I have to just check myself. And there, there are there are other signs. There are lots of signs of um, of the stages that you get into with stress and things about what you eat and how you speak and how you make eye contact and all that kind of stuff. But for me, those two things I know: if I'm snapping at and being annoying and irritating to other people, uh, if I am not finding the time to take a proper break in the day, then I need yeah. to start checking myself. Yeah, because people can do it for a day or two days, or if you if you haven't had the experience of burnout, maybe even longer. But it does catch up with you. Is is the essence of it? Um. So I want to just go back. We we talked about managers need people skills. Can you talk me through what mm -hmm. some of those skills are? So like that that perhaps you focus on in your training. You know, what are those people skills? Okay. Um. There's <clears throat> on a wider level. There, there are lots, obviously, but of for, for when we talk about honing in on employee well-being, there's, there's two. There's the ability to listen and then to empathize and talk with empathy, right? Um, and they sound so soft, doesn't it? Listen, oh, everybody yeah. listens. <laughs> but we, 
we often no. we're just trained to listen to hear what we want we 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 turn to instead of um talking to people i you speak i listen to what you say i analyze interpret and then i choose an appropriate response we just pause and wait to speak yep and the other thing is if we do that we're missing so many vital signs so if i come to you as your manager and say how are you doing petra and you go i'm fine and i am not listening fully actively listening i will take that fine at face value great so um the report that you were due to produce last, next week uh, how's it going and i haven't noticed that when you said fine you didn't smile you didn't make eye contact but your hair doesn't look as good as it normally does it looks great petra but you know what i mean i would not have picked it's got up dry shampoo in it i had to fake it <laughs> you know what i mean I, so the small listening, clues is what you're saying yeah because people struggling do not hold up signs going i'm struggling no sometimes but it's very rare that tends to be right at the very end and by that time just the longer you leave the support the longer it's going to take for them to recover. So if you want to pick up on the early signs, you've got to be attentive all the time. And it sounds like such a burdensome thing to do. It is easy for certain people. Certain personality types will find it easier than others, right? But if, if you are in a position of responsibility for other people in your organization, it is your duty, not just your moral imperative. That is actually what you're paid to do, is to make sure that your employees can do the job that they are assigned to do. So yeah, that, and then knowing how to respond, which isn't dismissing the things that you don't want to have to deal with because they're just too stressful for you right now. Yeah. It's actually being able to, to speak and listen with empathy, but also placing, um, giving the, uh, the, the person you're speaking to self-efficacy over whatever next steps they're gonna take. Because often when we talk to people, there will always be one or two people who say, yeah, but aren't you just letting them take the mickey out of you? Aren't you just giving them too much latitude? You're, you're just being a soft touch and people will just take the mick. And I'll say, not really. There's only such a tiny, tiny, minuscule 1% of people who might do that. We cannot legislate for that 1%. So instead, let's just assume that we've hired people who are trustworthy and when they say that they're stressed, we can help them and that they want to be helped so that they can come back to the workplace refreshed, restored and able to produce. That's what they want to do. Nobody wants to be just slacking. Yeah, but and helped, the word helped could mean many things. Like often we don't need to fix. You talked about efficacy, so it's about supporting individuals to take personal responsibility for their well-being. Uh, we've got a great uh, point here in the comments. I, th I think a lot of managers need skills to figure themselves out before trying to figure out their workforce. And I think I always say we need organizational responsibility, training, support from the top, guidance on culture, resources, all these things, and individual responsibility. Because you're right, if you're not able to be self-aware, thank you, LinkedIn user, for that comment, um, it's really tricky to support someone else. Um, and we've got one question here. You kind of answered it, but there may be a little bit more, more nuance. David, thank you for the question. How do we get the balance right? So you said this thing about taking the mick, right? And, and like, you know, th that mm -hmm. side of things. Between the compassionate manager and the soft touch, being compassionate can be seen as a weakness and employees can take advantage. So I, I guess I'm curious about what does that compassion look like? right or that that empathy look like because i think people forget that empathy as a soft skill uh, can also have directness clarity a clear request or mm -hmm. information about what's expected of the individual it doesn't mean you're now a pushover and walked all over and like i have empathy so do whatever you want right it's like this this balance it's a balancing act right what are your thoughts just on that piece i think you use the exact perfect word expectation yeah just because i'm empathizing with you and recognizing that the fact that your father is sick in hospital and your daughter is failing in school means that it's difficult for you to bring all of your full self into the workplace doesn't mean i don't have expectations of what you need to do 
to support me in the organization, right? So it just means that I will help you as far as I am able to. I will allow you to do flexible working, I'll allow you to change some shifts, get a few meetings, do whatever, but I still need this certain amount of work to do. It doesn't mean that you now have full latitude to do nothing because you told me. And it's that, that it's just because you are being empathetic doesn't mean that you're allowing people to do whatever they like. You still, still have, have expectations. Have yeah. They still have a job to do. It's just you are going to facilitate them in doing that job. You're going to make yeah. it possible for them to do that job. And I, what I think of it is, well, what would you expect of yourself in that situation? And if the answer is, well, I'd expect myself to just suck it up buttercup and carry on, then you do definitely need to do some introspective work and, and figure out, actually, is that realistic? Is that reasonable? Is that fair? Um, yeah, so that's what I think it is. Yeah, and I think... And the other thing I'd say... Go ahead. Is, sorry, sorry, Petra. The other thing I'd say is, who are you hiring that you don't trust that they want to do a good job for you? What has happened? To the employee that you interviewed, recruited, trained, and set free in your organization. Yeah. Yeah. That you now think that person is just trying to swindle me. Yeah. Well, what but, happened? But, oh, you've touched on a good point here. And I think this is this is why we're gonna get you back at some point. Um, around trust in a hybrid world, I think this is this is coming up more than ever. Like the micromanager versus the the person who's creating psychological safety. Like, how do we trust and empower our people, but also be a little bit more explicit about what's what's expected? So it's this kind of because we're remote and be, because people perhaps need to kind of understand where they're headed. That vision needs to be clear. But trust. I'm going to table the topic of trust because that's a huge one. Mm -hmm. Just so you have time to answer this this last question for today. Uh, and we're definitely going to get you back if you're game and your cat, obviously. Oh, brilliant. Um, it's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> Thank you, uh, LinkedIn user. Uh, how do you balance mental health and work pressures or competition for both yourself and the team? A loaded question, but maybe there's some some specifics that kind of spring to mind. Uh, and you're getting some comments around brilliant point brilliant points that you're making. So balancing mental health oh. and work pressures. So we've got deadlines. We've got to achieve. But then we're saying our mental health is important. Like, how the hell do we do both? If the two are mutually exclusive, I would challenge that. So there, there does come a point, right, when you are expected to do the impossible. You, you, there it becomes very difficult. That is where you need the, the ability and the strength and the trust relationship with your line managers to say, I can't achieve that. And they will need to have enough time, enough space, enough um, creativity to be able to find a workaround. But for the most part, it is a question of if I am looking after myself, myself on a, in a it's a biological, psychological way, right? Yeah, am yeah. I exercising enough? Am I um, eating right? Am I taking enough breaks? Am I spending time doing things like thinking of other people? All of that stuff that makes you a happy, healthy, thriving individual, it becomes much easier to tackle that mountain. The mountain always looks much higher when we are defeated, depressed down. So it is about knowing that it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. You look after your first, yourself first and then you look after others. That's what they always say on the airplanes, isn't it? You put yeah. your own oxygen mask on first before you take yeah. care of your children. I, I kind of challenge um, the that, well, well, I challenge it a little bit because I think sometimes I'm doing both at the same time. And that's sometimes the pandemic world that we're in is like, I got to invest in myself and make sure other things are okay, right? But also I think we get confused with like, what's looking after ourselves means, right? So like, I must meditate for an hour, then I must have a bubble bath, then I, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, what are the, it's like, yeah. I like the phrasing around active recovery and ways that you can integrate it into that busy life. Any any final thoughts on that? Yeah, we, we talk about the um, New Economic um, Foundation, I think New Economic Forum, five ways of well-being. That's yeah. it, it's very simple, it hasn't changed 
since 2012 or whenever it was. Yeah. Um, and that is connecting with other people, keeping physically active, um, noticing or, or being present in the moment. It's um, about giving to other people and continually learning. If you are doing those things, you are looking after your mind and your body. There's nothing in there says you have to meditate for an hour, because I can't, I do not have the patience. Yeah. <laughs> but you do need the ability to just connect yourself to the present for 10 minutes at a time. On a walk so or with a person or, yeah, Precisely. whatever it might be. And you can kid. find smart ways of combining these things so that it is manageable. But when we are under the gun, we the first thing that we normally give up on is ourselves. We do. I implore you, LinkedIn, do not give well, up on yourself. We go into survival mode. We start sorting everyone else out. We start work. One of the early signs of burnout is working harder, right? Um, you've got yeah. some some mm -hmm. great gratitude, uh, excellent points. Um, now, the idea with these LinkedIn Lives is to bring in amazing guest speakers and focus in on one topic just for 30 minutes to kind of highlight something, get your questions, get your involvement. So thank you to so much uh, so much to everybody who's joined in. And Gozi, where can people find you uh, if they want to work with you, if they want to hear more? I know you're on LinkedIn. Where else can people find you? Um, have a look for us on our website. I guess, Petra, you can drop a link, um, Aurora Wellness Group. .co.uk. Um, yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn and you can come and join us at one of our round tables. Oh, you have so many great things going on. It's been such a pleasure knowing you, uh, being a friend with you. We haven't seen each other since pre-pandemic yeah. though, so that, that's part of the plan. Um, and what's one thing you're going to do today to invest in yourself? Oh, I've already done it. Have I've you? already gone for my of run. The curve. Yeah, I've Head gone for my the run curve. this morning. I, I like don't to, miss it. Yeah, start, yeah, starting the day as you mean to go on, uh, getting your run in. Precisely. Um, uh, you've got some great love. First time you joined and you've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Umar and everybody else. And we will be back again soon. So take care and look out for more insight from us. Thank you, Petra. Thanks for having me.